Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. My name is Matthias Liffis. I'm from the Australian Research Data Commons. I would like to begin this webinar by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we are all on today. Uh, for me in Perth, that is the Noongar Wadjuk people. And I would like to pay my respects to their elders past and present. Today is the third in a webinar series that the ARDC has been presenting on the uh, sudden shift or the sudden need to shift to online delivery of uh, technical training. Uh, and I'm very pleased to introduce Aidan Wilson and Anastasios Papayoanou from Intersect in Sydney. Uh, and they will be uh, giving a presentation on how they're ensuring that the quality of their online training is just as good as the quality of their face-to-face -face training. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, please use the question module in uh, GoToWebinar. We'll have a facilitated Q&A session at the end. Over to you, Aidan. Uh, thanks, Matthias. Um, I, hope, um, I hope I'm being heard, uh, probably. Um, good over. Yes. Okay, um, yeah, thank you well. for the introduction. Um, great, thanks. Um, so my name is Aidan Wilson, and I'm a uh, I'm an e-research analyst um, at Australian Catholic University for um, Intersect Australia. Um, I'm also at the moment acting services manager for the Sydney metropolitan area, um, as an aside. And my colleague here, Dr. Anastasios Papayuanu, is our lead research data scientist. Um, he's chuckling because we've just been practicing how to pronounce his surname. Um, we used to we usually just call him the uh, Tassos Pap, but um, Anyway, uh, this so this uh, webinar is um, it's called Quality Tra Technical Training in a Post-Face-to-Face -face World. Um, sorry about the slightly dystopian title, um, but it kind of, I think, captures what we were thinking in, in, in March. Um, but it's a bit of a rosier outlook, um, as I'm sure we'll, we'll discover. Uh, before we start, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the uh, land on which we are respectively located. Uh, so for me, they are the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation here in, in the inner west of Sydney, and for Anastasios, they are the Kamaragal people, uh, also of the Eora Nation in, in the North North Shore. Um, and we pay respects to the to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Uh, so just a little bit of a, a background of what uh, who Intersect is. We are a not-for-profit, membership-based e-research organisation that was formed in 2008 by um, New South Wales universities and some state and federal seed money. Um, today we're governed by a consortium of 13 Australian universities who are our members and we oper operate across five states and territories. Here's a, um, uh, here is our members. Um, they're mostly uh, New South Wales universities uh, but we have later spread into ACT Victoria and most recently South Australia. Um, our model of um, uh, support really is is um, uh, centralised around our e-research analysts um, who form the services team, so me being one of them. Um, so this team is really the primary interface between Intersect and the respective member organisations. The e-research analysts are typically based on campus at their member university um, and uh, they work in conjunction with the existing support framework of research support networks within the uh, member university. So um, they dovetail in with existing uh, training uh, programs uh, and other research support programs and uh, other e-research governance frameworks and so forth. Um, uh, they also facilitate cross-institutional collaboration with the other e-research analysts, uh, helping each other out with shared problems. So the, this role combines e, IT research needs, business analysts, uh, sorry, business analysis, and research engagement across a very broad range of research activities and disciplines. The general responsibilities of this role are to provide advice, to gather research-specific IT requirements, and help guide the development and deployment of relevant e-research services. And lastly, to increase the visibility and acceptance of good e-research practice. Um, but today we're talking about training. So training is one of our most uh, popular services at our member universities, um, and here are a couple of here are a few uh, uh, broad level numbers. So to date, uh, and to date means we've we've been doing training since about 2012. Um, we have trained 15,000 researchers or more than in more than 1,200 courses at 15 institutions across five states and territories. Um, and here's a little graph showing the trajectory of of uh, attendance numbers. So you can see from a very uh, humble beginning in 
2012 with only 10 researchers. Um, that uh, that graph is is continuing to steepen, um, which I'm I'm glad to say that uh, uh, it's good to see a graph that's steepening. Um, no, that's not what I mean. It's this is one graph I'm glad that is steepening. Um, and uh, yeah, in 2019 we had uh, over three and a half thousand, I think, um, attendees. So it's getting uh, this training activity is getting bigger every year and more popular. This is a subset of our catalogue, our training catalogue. Um, we try to cover the breadth of e-research tools, uh, so not just programming, but also data management and collection tools like Qualtrics and Redcap, uh, research computing, so high-performance computing and cloud computing, and data analysis tools like Excel, SPSS, and OpenRefine. Um, and this catalogue is continually being updated and modified as we get more feedback and requests for different kinds of courses. We have always hesitated, hesitated to run online training. Um, over the years, we've tried it maybe a handful of times and we've never really had a great deal of success uh, doing that. Um, the reasons for this hesitation uh, are, for example, that, well, um, a big reason our, our training is so popular, we think, is that we focus on the interactivity, uh, not just attendees following along and using the tool themselves, but also interaction with other attendees. Um, also, tech training, we thought, surely needs in-person attention and assistance when things don't go exactly right. Um, so if someone can't install Python, we're, we're, if we're not in the room with them, it's going to be hopeless, um, is our belief. Um, it's uh, similarly too hard to help people with problems in an online setting. And we also anticipated specific challenges for each particular course or course type. So Qualtrics and Redcap, um, uh, uh, these are web apps, they're point and click, um, there's no installation um, and not a lot of keyboard shortcuts. We assumed that these courses would be much easier to deliver online than something like programming courses where uh, there tends to be a lot of individual help that we provide to attendees. Um, typically installation uh, provides lots of problems, syntax errors, spelling mistakes, uh, directory paths. So we thought that programming would be very challenging. Um, Excel, I'll mention on its own, we, uh, as a bit of a special case, um, we, uh, this tends to get a less technical audience and there's actually a lot of version issues, particularly when people are working from home um, and the difference between uh, Mac versions and Windows versions it has traditionally been quite, quite uh, the, the gap has been quite wide, although that's narrowing in, in recent years that kind of bring the, the programs a bit more together. Um, uh, but also there's a heavy use of keyboard shortcuts which are quite hard to demonstrate online unless you've got a webcam on your keyboard. So you actually find yourself saying things like the key above tab and next to one, um, whereas in the room people can literally see what you're what you're typing. So we thought that the Excel would be one of the most challenging courses for us to run online. Uh, another reason for the hesitation is that we have a very robust uh, workflow and system in place for face-to-face -face training and we weren't sure how this would translate to uh, or how we could extend this to, to an online um, uh, online tr uh, training offering. So for example, we do a lot of automated trainer assignment, automated reporting, and suddenly we've got exceptions in online training forcing us to radically change our systems to accommodate. Uh, one example is that for reporting purposes, uh, nowadays we want to track whether a course was online or face-to-face, -face, but uh, we've never had this concept in our systems. Um, whether you know all courses have just been face-to-face, -face, and so we never never thought to include that category. Um, and adding that category in in our system is not uh, not trivial, um, and causes some downstream issues as well. Uh, it it also means that trainers can now be um, so where trainers were usually uh, uh, based at a campus, they might they might have a range of universities or campuses that they could train at, and the system would automatically invite them if if a course was in their local area. Um, but for online courses, um, trainers can be invited uh, no matter where the course is is notionally being held, um, which means that the system should automatically invite these trainers to courses um, outside their local area but only if those courses are online. So that presents another challenge to kind of integrate these, these categories into the system. Uh, so, so the COVID-19 pandemic, um, which hit in the middle of March, I mean, 
earlier internationally, but in Australia when lockdowns really started was in the middle of March. Uh, so this forced us to, and everyone really, to put aside those hesitations and jump straight into online training. Um, so we started with a few pilot online courses using Zoom uh, in, the late, in, in late March. Um, and this was a monumental effort involving the entire services team in collaboration with members and other organisations. We tried, uh, we used these to try out different pieces of technology and methods. So we tried shorter courses, no more than half a day generally. Uh, we used Zoom um, with polls, chat, Q&A, breakout rooms or a combination thereof. We really tried each of them in, in the beginning to find out what was going to be um, uh, most beneficial. We found that communication is key, so sending out clear and concise instructions to attendees in the lead up to the course and uh, also being available in the half hour or so before the course started so that we could troubleshoot any um, any issues that were preventing people from, from uh, commencing in the course. Also during the course we had many breaks and opportunities for questions and discussion um, and we enhanced the role of the assistant trainer in doing things like moderating the chat answering questions and actively participating in the training. This pilot process was extremely quick. Um, our last in-person training course was March 13 and our first online course was March 24. So there was only one week in which there was a complete uh, suspension of training. Um, and then by April, we were back to about half capacity. Um, so the pilots really were only a couple of weeks um, before uh, we were back to half capacity in April. And I'd say we'd, we'd, we were already back at full capacity by uh, by the start of May. Um, so our setup has quickly evolved into something that looks a little bit like this with a primary instructor who leads the course uh, focusing on the content and at least one assistant or you know sometimes two assistants depending on the size of the course uh, managing the participants, answering questions, running polls, assisting individual attendees with issues and even running breakout rooms if and when they're needed. We also found it helpful to direct participants to a, a Google document with um, things like instructions, links to further information, uh, and also larger portions of text that can't be nested, uh, can't be pasted into the Zoom chat, like the whole, like whole code blocks in programming courses, for example. Um, so here's what it looks like from a user perspective. It's got a few screenshots um, and some uh, NAF animations, I hope you, you, you forgive me for that. Um, so this is what Zoom looks like, I'm sure everyone has seen it by now, uh, with the, the, the main uh, trainer sharing their screen, and in this case sharing um, IPython notebooks and running a Python course. Um, alongside this, there will be a, uh, a Zoom chat uh, where the trainer can provide links to information, so links to the Google Doc, for example, and where attendees can um, ask private or public questions to uh, to the trainers and get individual assistance. Um, occasionally we might throw up a, a Zoom poll um, to do things like gauge the experience that people already have. So at the beginning of a course we might have a poll that asks how experienced people are already with this tool. Um, that helps the trainer. Um, uh, you can do this in person quite easily because you can, you know, put people put up their hands and you can see if people are nodding um, but it's a bit harder online, so having polls to see how people are, are going along with it. Um, another use of polls is if there's a couple of modules of the course that you know, don't have time to cover both, but um, you want to vote, have people vote on which one they want to um, go into. So we've found polls to be quite useful as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we've got a Google Doc uh, separately from the Zoom meeting that people are encouraged occasionally to go into to copy out long pieces of code. Um, uh, or have their own note taking uh, if they want to share their notes with others, um, and that stays online. So we don't we don't tend to move those off. Um, unlike the Zoom chat, which uh, which unless someone remembers to save it, is pretty much expired um, at the end of the um, at the end of the meeting. So people can go back to that Google Doc later and get that code out if they want to. Uh, the last line of defence really is. Um, is the breakout room option. So we'll use this for more in-depth assistance. Um, so for example, if someone's just having a complete blocker, they can't uh, run the code, there's something wrong, they're not sure what it is and they don't know how to talk through it. So it's easiest for us to go into a breakout room for maybe one or two minutes, see their screen, catch them back up, um, and then go back to the main session. We This is the last line of defense because um, uh, obviously, while they're in the breakout room, they can't monitor the main session. So 
um, uh, uh, so they'll have to then be caught up to where the trainer is, which again the assistant will do when they when they come back into the main session. Okay, at this point I'll um, hand over to Anna Sassios who will start talking about the uh, numbers and the reporting that we've been getting out of uh, online training for 2020. Okay, thanks Aidan. And so we thought with Aidan that it's going to be uh, also good to present you some numbers uh, in terms of what we have done for online training and compare with in-person training. So here you see a summary of our total numbers in 2020. So you can see the in-person training and the online training. So the courses we delivered, how many unique courses we delivered based on our course catalog and the researchers and staff trained. So for online training in this two, three months, like almost three months, like two and a half, that we delivered around 50 courses um, to about 800 people. Uh, one of the things that we would like to mention here is the registrations per course, which has an asterisk for online training. So we can see that the registration per course uh, is 24.8 for in-person training, while is 19.2 for online training. And the attendance per course is 19.6 for in-person, whereas is 16.1. Uh, so even though there is a SOAP up rate like higher in online training, like the attendance per course and the registration per course are lower, and this is not because like the demand is slower, actually it's higher. It's because like we thought that in the beginning of the courses in the delivery of the first trials and early pilots, like we should limit the number of registrations because we didn't feel comfortable and confident about the quality. So we wanted to ensure that the quality is really good. We wanted to ensure that every person who comes to our courses is gonna have the same interactivity and um, uh, we're gonna deliver the same quality of training. So in uh, March, where we had the full capacity of our training again going on online, uh, we thought that we can increase this number. So from now on, actually, we start increasing slowly the numbers and see actually like up to what level we can um, manage. So that's why these numbers are a bit lower. So if you go to the next slide, Aiden. So all the numbers from now on uh, refer to um, the online training in 2020. So all these numbers refer to the data we collect for online training. And I'm going to try to give you some, um, uh, discuss a bit about the comparison with historical data we have. For example, here we see the number of attendees per course and the course category. So usually like this is a bit uh, probably misleading compared to our historical data because one of the most popular course categories we deliver is the programming one, of course. So last year, programming was the most popular by far, and 53% of the courses delivered were programming courses. Whereas now we see for online training more like data management courses, which are probably like um, uh, if you um, go to our uh, website, you're going to see that it's like Qualtrics, RedCup. This kind of tools and this is because we thought in the beginning that early pilots are better to for like web app applications like red cup and qualtrics because it's point and click so we thought that it's going to be easy to start with them and then also programming courses required a lot of preparation so we wanted to make sure that the installation the setup instructions all the things before we deliver a programming course were there and also be ready with some backup options in case like uh, attendees have some problems, for example, with installations, with Jupyter in Python or with our studio in R. So that's why we see a bit of like, um, we see programming um, being a bit lower. Uh, now, in, since we deliver um, our training in full capacity, we have scheduled all the programming courses and like we're probably going to see later on this year that programming is going to go on the top. So in the next slide, we can see the uh, attendees per course. So this is also consistent with what we see in our historical data. So for online training, we can see that um, the main three categories like data management, data analysis, and programming have more than 15 attendees per course. This is uh, again based on the limitation of 20, most of the time 20 uh, registrations per course per course. So it's it's really good numbers and we see a decrease in the uh, number of the percent of the percentage of no-sows. 
So this is also like um, consistent with what we get. And from last year to this year, actually, we can see an increase in each course category. So attendance per course uh, in each category are increased. And the largest increase can be found in data management, where like last year we had around 20.8. And now we can see in online training and in-person training is around like 15, 16 people. So we also collect data about like the different roles and position and also the different FR codes for the attendees. So for the role and position, we see that the biggest portion of uh, attendees is actually the biggest percentage is like PhD students, following, followed by professionals and then academics, postdocs, and uh, a few uh, master students and honors. So here I would like to mention that like um, in online training, we see around 38% of uh, attendees are PhDs, whereas like staff and academics are 22 and 17. Historically, like PhD students actually are um, almost 50% of the courses. So we see a drop in the PhD, the number of PhD students attending our courses, and we see a significant increase in the staff from 15% to 22, and we see also like another considerable increase in academics and postdocs. So we see that professionals, academics, and postdocs are like willing to go fast and learn more tools actually probably because they want to continue their research and they want to learn actually how to use these kind of research tools to keep going with their research. And on the right side, we see actually like um, the FR codes. So one of the most popular ones historically is uh, medical and health, uh, health sciences, students and academics and stuff, uh, followed by psychology, biological science and all this. So in, the actual data we have is more like, again, like medical students are the most like popular uh, FR code, but followed by other ones. So this is mainly like shifted a bit, like, and we see a few differences because we deliver more quadrics and ser um, survey tools, like Red Cup uh, ser survey tools. So it means that we see a more participation from these kind of um, sciences. So we thought that it would be interesting also to show you a bit of data about how many people return to a course. So for online training in 2020, we see around like 19% of people returning to a course. This is based on the 50 courses we delivered and in different universities. So this is quite low compared to our historical, historical data because first of all, we limited the number, um, actually what we call tourists. So like people who can jump from different institutions to the university. So, um, so this means that not many different courses delivered yet in um, the same university. So we see a bit of drop. Historically though, like the uh, return to a course is around 20% um, in our courses. So 20% of people um, attended two or more of our courses. And we do this analysis also per role and we do it per FR code. So I can just tell you that uh, the highest percentage of return to a course is, has been seen in uh, PhD students with 27%, followed by postdocs around 23, academics around 22, professionals 21, and the lowest by far percentage is in honor students, which is around 12%. So a few things about course registrations. We try also to um, find different ways and capture the different ways that work for the, to raise awareness about like the course, the courses we deliver and the services we deliver. So we try to ca capture actually how did they, like the registrars, uh, the registrants hear about the course. And we can see here all the different uh, options we give. So like most the on the top is faculty and school newsletter then followed by research office and division, university website, newsletters from the university, supervisor, and word of mouth as well is quite popular as well. But we go one step further and we do the same and we check per role, just to check the different strategies for different people. So here we can see like somewhere in the middle in a column, the PhD students where you can see that most of them um, hear about the course from the faculty newsletter and then followed by university website and uh, not research office and then university website. Whereas for professionals, we can see that most of them hear from their supervisor or from the research office. So we can see different patterns actually like based on the different roles and positions. So we try to capture these ones to um, be better in the communication uh, and the engagement part for our courses. 
Okay, let's move on and now like talk a bit about the feedback. So after each course, we send a really short course evaluation survey. And also we send this a week after we deliver a course, like I send automatic email to ask the attendees to fill in this short survey. So here is just like um, uh, a few information from our, a uh, few uh, questions from our survey. And we focus on the delivery actually, like I wanted to show you like the quality of the delivery and what we capture. So here are some questions like, did you feel that the training course atmosphere was welcoming, comfortable interacting with the instructors? So if the instructors, you feel that they were knowledgeable, if they gave clear answers and if they were good communicators. So these are particularly useful for us because now, especially like that we're trialing uh, a new service like online training, we want to know that we deliver like similar or um, same quality as in person. So you can see that all the average scores are more than nine out of 10 in a scale from zero to 10, which is uh, extremely good and um, make us feel more confident that we deliver really good quality training in this new setup. So we capture also some uh, feedback in terms of um, like good and bad aspects of training and also any suggestions. So we take this feedback really seriously because it's one of the big things that we check when we for example, test a new tool or check a new setup, or we would like, for example, to develop a new course. So here we can see like a, a few comments talking about the polls, how good were actually like when like people were feeling lost or how we can capture like if they're on track. Uh, a lot of people were talking about their interactivity of the course and that the setup with the multi, uh, many instructors was really helpful and where we were sure that everybody can get some help. Um, some people also mentioned that this is a good opportunity to have this training online for later on after COVID-19 is not an issue anymore and keep it because like of the many people being in remote unis or in like other campuses and distributed campuses and they cannot attend this um, face to face. So we take this feedback really seriously. So the last part of the course evaluation service, uh, survey is about the net promoter score. So this is one way we check also the quality of the course. So we ask them the question, how likely is that you would recommend in a training courses to colleagues? And for people who don't know what the net promoter score is, actually we take the percentage of people who respond in nine or 10 to this question, a zero to 10 question. We take this percentage of prom promoters, so nine and tens. We subtract the percentage of detractors, so people who answered zero to six. And then we have a number between minus 100 up to plus 100. So plus 50 is considered excellent. And in-person training this year, based on the 355 responses, um, was around uh, was 56. Uh, surprisingly, online training based on the 379 responses is plus 74. So which is considerably high actually compared to in-person training. And we were trying to think actually what were the reasons to like of, of this change and like that online training is much higher. So we think that probably this is because like all the training, all the online training, or I should say most of the online training because now we have also like uh, casuals being involved, uh, has been delivered by all our experienced e-research analysts. So e-research analysts had like all of them delivered more than 20, 30 courses in the past. So they have the experience, they, they know the environment, they, they know how to manage actually difficulties and problems. They're more interactive. They, they, they have the experience actually to make this more interactive and make sure that everything is going well. So we think that this is probably one of the main reasons we see this difference. But in order to compare them like in a fair way, we should just do the two delivery methods actually after COVID-19 is an issue and then we can see actually like just to minimize the external factors. So final takeaways. So online training, as we said, and as Aidan said, actually requires a few things before you deliver it. So you need to carefully plan and you need to um, do some logistics beforehand. You need to communicate with all the attendees to be sure that everything is uh, ready before the course. This is a really important step actually before you can lose a lot of time in the beginning of a course by dealing you, with all these problems. And you like already the pace is a bit slower because it's online and set up. So it takes a bit of time actually like to like 
um, to go ahead with all these problems. So make sure that everything is ready is really important. Of course, it relies also on technological tools um, that are used appropriately, like Zoom and all the different features of Zoom and all the other tools like backup options like RStudio and all these things. Like if you have a cloud version or if you have Jupyter in a cloud version and goes on. And of course, like requires smaller class sizes and more trainers. So more overhead to prepare things, to prepare a course, and then requires more assistance and smaller class sizes. So online training can work. Um, we found that online training can work as well as in-person training. So the hesitation we had in the beginning was actually proved that it shouldn't be that uh, much. And uh, we proved that online training, if you put quite a lot of effort, can be as good as in-person training and sometimes may better suit uh, the diverse needs of researchers, especially when they are in distributed campuses, like Aidan is going to talk a bit more in the, uh, in the last slide. And also like um, we need to have like careful attention to the planning and the delivery. So again, like it needs more overhead, but if you manage to um, take into account all these things, um, delivery and quality of training, it can be like similar to uh, in-person training. Over to you, Aidan. Um, yeah, so this is, the, this is the final slide, really. Um, uh, this wouldn't be complete without talking about what, what happens now um, in a post-post face-to-face world. Um, and I, I think we, it's worth pointing out that we've, we thought this was going to be, um, we didn't know uh, whether uh, the COVID-19 pandemic was going to be um, brief or very long. Um, it's been briefer, or it looks to have been it looks like it's going to be briefer than we that we had planned. Um, it wasn't feasible for us to uh, suspend training and wait until we could uh, recommence face-to-face -face training um, uh, because if the pandemic had lasted for say the rest of 2020, then uh, we would be in a very uh, bad situation with respect to um, our members and the value that they expect from us, um, of which training is a huge uh, part. So our original plan was to run training online while the lockdowns were in place and then return to face-to-face -to -face training after the pandemic was over. Um, this is based on the, you know, on the unfounded belief that face-to-face -face training was, was just better for attendees and therefore better value for, uh, for members. Um, but our success in online training and the numbers that we've seen and have shown today uh, lead us to um, rethink this plan. And so that when things return to normal, um, which thankfully is looking to be sooner rather than later, um, we may very, we're very likely to keep um, an online training uh, platform as an alternative alongside our more, our more traditional in-person training. So this will allow us to work with our members um, more closely to, to design tailored training programs at the university given their situation. So regional universities, for example, with many remote campuses uh, like ACU or Western Sydney, and others, uh, they may prefer to plan more online training to cater, their, to, to cater to their distributed research community, whereas the larger metro-based universities that are probably a bit more monolithic, like UNSW in Sydney, um, they may prefer to return to face-to-face -to -face training. Um, more likely, I think, um, every university will want some kind of mixture. So there'll be some in-person in in training uh, and online training. Um, uh, you know, one question is if if the numbers are so good why don't we switch entirely to online training and i think you know as anastasia has covered on the previous slide um it takes a lot of setup um it takes a lot of things to get to get it right and also we can't we we don't want to fit the same number of people in the room because um we're, we're hesitant that um, we can't train as many people as we can when it's face to face so i think we'll all always have a place for face to face training um uh, but our success has shown that, you know, we we should also make sure we've always, always got a place for online training in the future. And on that note, I will say thank you very much um, and uh, hand back over to Matthias. Great. Thanks, guys. That was fantastic. Uh, we've had several questions come in. Uh, so a reminder to all attendees, you can um, post questions in the question module and I will read them out to Aidan and Anastasios. Uh, so the first question we had um, is a logistical question. How do you ensure that your registrants for online courses are from your member organisations uh, and not 
necessarily any member of the public. Um, this is a this is a perennial problem that is not not just related to online training. Uh, we use Eventbrite for uh, registrations, um, and you can't limit people in Eventbrite from registering to um, to to courses based on their um, based on their email address or, or anything like that. It's not AAF authenticated, so we can't put it behind a an authentication layer uh, or anything like that. It's a it's just an issue we deal with. We get we get a we get a few people um, per. Um, I don't know what the rough numbers are, but the very small numbers of people who aren't from any of our members turning up, um, and uh, we, it's not enough for us to worry about, so we'd rather not kick people off courses. We have had in the past though, um, and I mean before uh, online training, we've ha we have had, uh, I was running a session for ACU people, um, for ACU research specifically, but that um, ad <laughs> went out uh, to someone else who was from a different university and we had half of the registrants being from that other university. So I had to step in then and, and uh, politely tell them that this was for an ACU audience and um, apologise, but I had to basically revoke their tickets. Um, but with online training, we do get the um, the case where, you know, it's much more possible, obviously, for people to enrol in courses that aren't at their home institution. Um, we call these tourists, as, um, as Anastasios has uh, foreshadowed before um, we, we don't we don't generally um, one or two people per course we don't really care about uh, but we have um, put in place basically people when they sign up to our courses acknowledge that the course is for the home institution and that if they are not from the home institution then they risk their ticket being reallocated to someone on the waiting list for example um, so that's been how we've we've done that just by warning people that we may do this and they have to click a box to say that they accept that Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, okay, next question. Um, this one's a little long. Uh, so a, a wealth of literature has shown that instructor evaluations are heavily biased by the likability of uh, individual instructors, uh, instructors sorry, versus the student learning outcomes. Do you use any metrics that evaluate whether students have acquired the skills that you are teaching, or do you write, rely solely on the likability metrics the the net promoter score that you presented yeah good problem the net promoter score is obviously not without its problems and um i'm not you know personally across all the literature but i'll take i'll take the the question as um uh word for it that um that uh, there are problems with 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 doing evaluations like that we have tried in the past uh to to reach out to uh, former attendees um say a couple of years after uh, and try to um, ask them whether they have used the techniques that uh, they, they learned in the courses. Uh, it's pretty hard to run that. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a pretty hard metric to kind of nail down really because um, someone might come along and learn some Python and then they might never use it again, but they might be a bit more knowledgeable about things like programming or they might have learned a different programming language. And so it's, it's hard for us to causally relate those, uh, those things. Um, so just so, <clears throat> sorry, Aiden. Just okay. to add on this, actually, like our actual model is based on this further support. So we know that the curve is steep for all these research tools. So the main point, actually, of this training after we finish the training is actually to give them, like you know, conduct of the ERA of the institution, and then keep in contact with the person, like with the ERA, and try to uh, help them actually like overcome this steep curve, and then try to assist up to the point where they feel more comfortable to just do the research themselves or use the tool. So we know that this is quite hard and we try to do different like surveys to capture this. But one of the main points of our uh, services is actually having ERAs actually to help during all these like steps of the learning process. Yeah, that's a good point. So the um, speaking from personal experience in the last three weeks, I've had an explosion of REDCap um, uh, uh, consulting requests. Um, and half of those are a direct result of people attending a Red Cup course. So um, people who have seen what it can do in the training and need need to really tailor it to their um, exact project. Um, so that this is where Intersect kind of sees training as not um, it's an end within itself, but it's also a pathway to 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 further engagement and uh, research support with not just individuals but teams. Um, so it fits into the whole uh, whole workflow. 
Okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, now something about uh, teacher student ratio. So it looks like you're currently working with about three per 16 participants, uh, but you mentioned that you were working to bring this ratio down. What do you think might be ideal? Mm, I guess post COVID, our ratio, um, and the we, we, we always have two trainers at, at every course. Uh, actually, no, that's not, not true. There, there's sometimes we um, we have the e-research analysts on their own delivering courses that they are very good at and, and comfortably can deliver themselves. Um, it's up to them how much they try to limit those courses. Uh, they're typically limited to around about 10 to 12. Um, uh, when we have casuals delivering courses, we want them to have no more than around about uh, uh, 10 to 12 per trainer. Um, we are careful not to go too too far, too large class sizes or too big a ratio difference between too, too big a ratio of, of, of uh, students to, to instructors. Um, and so we've been carefully tracking the feedback and so on. And uh, it turns out that I, I think um, uh, pre-coronavirus in 2020, the larger numbers of you know nearly 20 people per course um, uh, on average, and some courses much higher, um, we haven't seen a drop off in in, in evaluations, um, which is surprising actually. So so we've had larger class sizes, and and the the feedback has been better actually. I think um, one out of one uh, instructor per train trainer uh, trainees is the ratio we try to keep in person, and but now with online training and all the overhead, like it goes probably like one to six. Which is which? Um, like actually, like it's quite low, but we wanted to be sure that the quality is good. But so now we keep um, going up slowly and trying to test actually if we can increase this. But we're not going to reach something like more than one to ten pressure. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, we've got a couple more questions, so um, we were scheduled to finish uh, right now, but I think we can we can go for a couple more minutes. Um, so uh, next question, it's often a struggle to get participants to provide feedback and return evaluation surveys. Did you achieve a higher return rate for surveys when participants were engaging online? Yes, yeah, yes. I can answer this one actually, like because like based on the numbers we have, like we have like more people actually answering and actually doing the survey. But this is also because we introduced a new system as well because uh, we automated the process. We know that a lot of people when we do the training courses they don't stay up to the end because we may go a bit, um, you know, we may be a bit late. So it means that we may lose these people and they don't have the, the time or the, the survey link. So what we do actually like with um, the training team is we send an email a week after to all the people who attended the course like saying that you attended this course if you have like two minutes, please fill in the survey. And we saw like a really big increase in the number of uh, people who actually do this survey actually later on. So it's-, it's another, reason, really um, another reason we wanted to do that is uh, our, our feedback prior uh, to doing this was possibly biased towards those people who stayed to the end and therefore got the instruction to go to do the survey. So um, this way we're, we're getting, we, we hope possibly more honest feedback and we are getting some, you know, of course we do get bad feedback, everyone, it's bad feedback occasionally. The training can't cater to to everybody um, uh, uh, exactly. But um, uh, to answer the question, we I was just looking at the numbers. Um, we have 803 people trained post COVID and 825 trained pre COVID, and um, or pre online training, I suppose. And if we look at the numbers, that's 375 responses for online versus 355 for in person. So it's a slight bump. Um, but also 2020 overall is is much improved over over previous years because of the follow up um, a week later to ask people and and we send them a direct link to a, a half pre deal pre filled in form so they don't have to remember what day it was they don't have to remember which university it was and so on so I think that's improved in the um, some courses in fact um, are getting a hundred percent response rate um, which was unheard of before. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, right, so next question. Uh, this one's a bit uh, provocative. Um, so this person wonders if a factor on the net promoter score being higher with online training 
is the participants baseline expectations on the quality of online versus face to face training. So they're assuming that online training will not be as good. Do you have any thoughts on this? Yes, I think that is definitely an element. Um, there was some uh, there was some open ended feedback in the first couple of courses that we ran uh, where people you know, were quite glowing about it. And they were like, oh, thanks. This was wonderful. I didn't expect it to be good. Right. Um, so, yes, it was probably um, or, you know, people said like better than expected. Um, so, yes, uh, there probably is definitely an effect where people um, people's expectations were lower for online training. Um, uh, just impressionistically, having uh, led a few courses and assisted a few other courses. Um, I, th I think I think people's um, interactivity in the course and and uh, the, the, the the chat and so on. I think online training the way we're doing it is, um, you know, pretty much working just as it, as well as it did in person. I just think in person it's a little bit easier to maintain that social nature with with your attendees because they're right there in your face, whereas you know you only see a little icon for somebody and maybe a, a virtual hand going up or something. Um, but yes, we def I, I, I have noticed that that effect of... Another factor is also probably that they appreciate the fact that we still do online training and they have the opportunity to do online training. So that's why I said like this is not probably a realistic and we cannot compare these two numbers because there are so many different factors actually contributing yeah. to this increase. So we're not we didn't show actually to compare, we show actually just to see the numbers. And we know that this is probably, be, <clears throat> sorry, because of different factors, external factors that probably wouldn't be uh, if you were delivering both at the same time without having any restrictions, any problems or any issues. So, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so one last question. So um, uh, this one is, do you get proportionally more bad feedback for courses with prerequisites than beginner ones with no prerequisites? I think uh, it's the opposite. No, I don't think so. I think we get really like some feedback of like intro to courses because I can tell you like my experience like based on the feedback I read all the time. So I feel like in intro courses it's really hard to set expectations. So it means that mm. for example, the programming course, like we call it like let's say programming with R or Python, so it's really hard to set expectations who is supposed to come to this course. So we thought that like this course is delivered only for people who don't have any prior knowledge, but then you have people who have other knowledge in a bit of knowledge in other programming languages coming to this one feel that, oh, this is too slow. So it's really hard to, to get the right audience. Whereas in more advanced uh, topics, like people can see the topic and they know straight away like what it's about and they are like, they, they know that they spend time more on the topics they want. So I think intro courses are a bit more like, like we get a bit more um, like, not negative, but a bit more constructive, let's say feedback, like on like how to improve well, this yeah. kind of thing. When we read into the, when we read between the lines with the negative feedback for the intro courses. And so actually I should point out, it's contrary to what the questioner um, assumed that we'd, that we'd have bad feedback for the advanced courses or courses with prerequisites. But in fact, the bad feedback that we get is for the, um, introductory courses, as Anastasia uh, pointed out. And um, uh, it's when we read between the lines, it's, it's mostly about expectation setting, um, that people are expecting this to be a Python course. They know already, they want to learn some Python, and what they get for half that day is uh, fundamental programming, not uh, Python. So that's that's been the source of a, a lot of the bad feedback. So we're actually rethinking how we market um, the introductory courses and we're thinking of doing something like running a you know a few um, I don't want to give away too much but uh, having you know break not breaking it up but having a, a couple of more introductory awareness level uh, courses that that lead into the introductory not courses having like uh, awareness level webinars that lead into introductory courses and making it clear for people that if they know any programming language that the introductory courses are probably too basic and they should um, go straight to the, the second level, intermediate level of, of, of um, so if they've done some Python, they can go straight into the intermediate R, for example. Um, okay, we're, we're kind of working through that now on the basis of some of the feedback we've been getting from earlier this year. 
Okay, uh, that was it for questions. So uh, I'd like to thank you once again, Aidan and Anastasia, for presenting this uh, insightful webinar. Um, and uh, your email address is there on the screen if anybody would like to follow up with you directly. Um, otherwise, I would like to wish everybody a fantastic day. Uh, and we're getting some more question, uh, sorry, more more feedback, positive feedback about the webinar. So you're getting some great comments there. <laughs> oh, great. Thank you very much. And thank you, Matthias, for, for facilitating this and ARDC. It's a really great much. seminar, a webinar series you've been, you've been putting together. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Okay. Thank you.